I'm sure more people will be trickling in in the next few minutes. Uh, but I will say welcome. Uh, good morning. That's a very strange thing for me to say. I rarely get to say good morning. So good morning in the perkiest voice I possibly can. And uh, welcome to the Science During the Pandemic panel, which I am very eager to hear, given that I probably have COVID right now. Um, I want to see what you guys have been up to. Uh, we do not have Catherine Asaro yet. I'm sure she's on her way. Uh, we do have the other two panelists, the extraordinary David Lee Summers and the crackerjack Dr. Dave, Dr. David Williams. And I will happily hand over to you guys to introduce yourself properly and uh, run away with the show. Thanks, Al. Thank you, Hal. Um... I guess I'll, I'll go ahead and start. Uh, my name is David Lee Summers, and I am a writer by day and an astronomer at Kitt Peak National Observatory. Uh, I have about a dozen novels, uh, just came out with a novella called Breaking the Code, uh, set during the early days of World War II in North northwestern New Mexico. Um, basically, we've just spent uh, the last year and a half at Kitt Peak National Observatory kind of coming up with a new normal mode of observing. Uh, I think a lot of people, uh, I, I have, I re at least from, from things like Facebook comments and so forth, where people sort of still have sort of the image of the astronomer at the telescopes looking through an eyepiece or, or at least sitting by the room at a computer um, but of course, we've been commissioning new instruments, uh, partly for uh, Department of Energy and partly for NASA, which uh, commissioning new things and especially big, new, uh, high tech, exciting things like we have usually require a lot of experts in the room and our control rooms aren't very big. So, you know, social distancing became uh, something of a challenge and we actually spent about eight months uh, before we closed down at Kitt Peak, uh, figuring out how to reopen safely for everyone who is there. And uh, since then, we've been operating in sort of this, this new normal mode where most of us have been uh, quite distant from one another. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to you, David. Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Dave Williams. I go by Dr. Dave at Cons. I'm a research professor in the School of Earth and Space Exploration at Arizona State University. I'm a volcanologist and planetary geologist by training. I spend most of my time working on NASA uh, robotic flight missions, exploring the planets and moons and asteroids of the solar system. And uh, uh, currently my main focus, I'm a co-investigator and the deputy lead for the multispectral imager on NASA Psyche mission, which we've been developing over the last four years and is scheduled to launch about a year from now in August of 2022. Uh, just to preamble what David uh, said there about uh, how things have gone since the pandemic started, we went into lockdown, it was about early March of 2020. This was about two weeks before our annual Lunar and Planetary Science Conference that's held in Houston every year. And because of that shutdown, that conference was just plain canceled. And that was the first time it was canceled, you know, ever since the Apollo 11 samples were returned. The first meeting was in, in March of 1970. Um, ASU very quickly switched to online learning and all the classes switched to online. I was not teaching in the, in the spring of 2020, but uh, the labs all shut down at ASU, including my lab. I'm the director of the NASA Planetary Image Lab at ASU. And through the, the spring and most of the summertime, uh, there was just nobody in there. Uh, I, you know, we, we, uh, we were all told to, to try, or try and work from home. And it was a bit of a challenge for me because I had this one year NASA project that was funded and the money was being spent on salary, but we weren't getting any work done. Um, and it wasn't until about July of 2020 that they we were able to reopen. We had to wear masks in the lab all the time, you know, distancing and cleaning everything all, all the time. There wasn't too many people in the building uh, over the course of the last, you know, academic year or so. But we started a project in, in July of 2020 and we just finished it uh, two weeks ago. Um, uh, taking time out. So on one end, 
having the pandemic shutdown did enable myself and my assistant to get a project done that we needed to, but you know it 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 was really a, a problem. It, it, it enhanced because I actually got infected with COVID and was sick with COVID uh, during the first half of January 2020. Uh, my wife caught it from me. She was uh, sick even worse, uh, but we were both recovered by the end of January. My lab assistant, he and his wife got COVID in December of, of 2020. Uh, so they, they were affected. So we effectively lost two months of work completely just because of dealing with the virus ourselves. Um, the academic year, 20, uh, fall 2020 and spring of 2021 was all remote learning. Um, I, I just participated in one class myself uh, this past spring 2021 semester and you know through Zoom. Zoom has saved uh, a lot of our lives there. Um, that's, that, 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 that's gotten us through it there. And things have, have sort of reopened this past summer. And of course, those of you who are familiar with ASU is now teaching almost exclusively in person, although there are still mass requirements in, in rooms that have small uh, you know, space where you have a lot of people clustered, including the class I'm teaching at ASU this semester. So that's sort of an essential starting point to talk about it. And as we go on, if people are interested, I can talk about the impacts on the psyche mission due to COVID. I can talk about the impacts to my colleagues and doing research and our switch over to online conferences. There's several other aspects we can discuss. Uh, back to you, David. Yeah, and I think uh, just to highlight a couple of those points, uh, one thing to note is that my daughter actually started college uh, in right in the middle of all of this. She started in, in the fall semester of 2020 and uh, spent the strangest freshman year ever of college in, in the sense that she went to Northern Arizona University and uh, basically spent the whole year in her dorm room taking remote classes. So it was nothing like the kind of uh, uh, in-person learning experience you might uh, normally think of. And, uh, but nicely over the summer, she ended up getting a job as an intern at NASA Ames, but it was a remote internship. She, uh, they, they weren't actually having any interns in San Francisco, so she ended up uh, staying uh, here at my home in uh, Las Cruces, and all summer they sent her a laptop, and she ended up uh, working on data from, from the house uh, with uh, Dr. Steve Howell, who was a former uh, head of the NASA Kepler mission, and uh, basically uh, really interesting research, uh, which we can talk about a little bit, but what I know of it, and uh, but uh, very much remote. Um, it did actually result in, in one interesting thing that was kind of uh, good and bad in that uh, at the WIN 3.5 meter telescope, we're commissioning the NUID uh, spectrograph, which I talked about yesterday during the during the talk of, about the the project. And uh, so we ended up commissioning it most of the way before the pandemic started, uh, the winter of 2019 into the spring of 2020, and then we had to close home, close up, button the whole instrument up, and were sent off the mountain. Um, they were able, you know, because one person, one or two people could come up at a time. Uh, they did have a couple of the instrument specialists who made use of that time to come up and make some tweaks to the instrument based on what was learned during commissioning. And then we ended up spending the winter of uh, 2020 and 2021 recommissioning the instrument. So essentially it got commissioned uh, twice and it's just passed its uh, NASA design review. Excellent. Yeah, uh, the uh, NASA Psyche mission, it's a, it's a robotic mission discovery class. It's gonna uh, schedule, it's scheduled to launch in August, beginning of August of, of next year. And we are in what is called the uh, Phase D ATLO, uh, which is assembly testing and launch operations. And for most of uh, this year, the, the spacecraft was delivered from the, the contractor who built the main spacecraft to the Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena. And we've been adding in instruments and avionics and, and other things that JPL specifically had, had built. And the instruments are coming from various contractors, including uh, uh, Denmark for the magnetometers. And I, I guess the overall statement I would say is that COVID has slowed things down. Some of the contractors, they, they had employees who got COVID, so that decreased the time so that 
instruments are coming in later than what we had planned. But um, everything should be able to be installed on the spacecraft and we should still be able to meet our launch opportunity next, next year. Um, it, but that was the fundamental effect is that it, COVID is, and, and the work restrictions, working from home, uh, having to resort to Zoom or WebEx or whatever your favorite video conference system is, you having to use that for meetings instead of in-person meetings, um, that really uh, slowed things down on the development of flight missions. And I, I would say in regards to what David said about his daughter, you know, going to school, um, the students who I've talked with who had to, to try and learn through uh, uh, online learning and who have now are back and in, 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 the, in the classroom for the class I'm teaching, they say they very much prefer the in-person mode of learning, that, that for some of them, they really have a difficult time interacting and, and getting the full measure of, of their education through the online process. So, um, you know, I go ahead. I was just going to say, uh, yeah, just to highlight that uh, over the summer, while she was doing the NASA internship, uh, she decided to, uh, to take second semester physics, which, of course, is not an easy class and she's doing this in a, as a six week summer class on her own and she's really started to struggle and I realized that you know part of what made it work for me was being able to just talk to my fellow students and and you know hash out these problems and talk about the problems so I ended up uh, essentially basically being a tutor and sitting in on the remote classes with her just to be a sounding board and talk about it and kind of you know, of course, you know, let her do the homework and, and do the homework. But I, you know, it was kind of like, okay, let's talk about why this works and, and why you got the answers you got. And, and you know, her, her scores improved tremendously by just that. But, you know, I, I think for a lot of, uh, a lot of this year that that in and of itself has been a difficult thing because for me as a as a science student it was it was incredibly valuable to spend time with my fellow students and talk about these things and you know try some of the you know just kind of do some of the thought experiments on our own and and just you know take our own take our time digesting all of this information yeah i would agree and i i would say that People came up with innovative solutions to things in place of being able to interact in person. Matter of fact, um, the graduate students um, in our department at ASU uh, actually used the Discord software and they created sort of a, a, a Discord online uh, interaction and support community that they used during the, the last academic year to, to stay connected because when you're a graduate student in the physical sciences, um, you really need that support network of your students to help you get through the challenges of, 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 of graduate school. And uh, so they found a creative way to do that. Is our third panelist here? Dave, stop rocking back and forth. You're making me dizzy. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> Yeah, I don't see Catherine yet, so. Okay. Well, do, do folks in the audience have specific questions we can elaborate on? Because uh, we'll, we can continue to talk, but if, if there, there's questions about how COVID has impacted different aspects of the science and stuff that we do, or write it in the chat. I, I can see the chat window in this mode. Yeah, same with me, so. I... I, I will just while while people are maybe thinking of questions, I'll you know talking about Zoom meetings and such. That I, I mentioned that we spent eight months uh, trying to figure out how to operate safely in this whole new world, and what we came up with was you know we Kit Peak has has been moving towards a model of remote observing where observers don't necessarily travel to the observatory. And maybe I'll back up a minute and, and just explain that how Kit Peak has traditionally worked is that you apply for time on the telescope, you get your week or two weeks out on the telescope, and then you you are then then you come out to the telescope and spend your time there getting your data uh, for that particular program and, and hope you, you kind of pray to the weather gods that they're going to be cooperative and you're actually going to get uh, be able to use the telescope for 
uh, what you're doing. And those of us that are the on-site experts, my job is really to make sure that people who come to the observatory get the, the data they hope to get. And, you know, I've been fortunate enough to work with people like uh, Vera Rubin, who, you know, and, and uh, who is one of the people who discovered uh, the rotation curves of uh, galaxies and how those work, and Saul Perlmutter, who is instrumental on uh, discovering dark energy. You know, so it's it's you get to kind of work with these people, but you know, travel expenses have have come up, and so there's and of as we have gotten better abilities to work remotely through computers, even before the pandemic, we've had more instances where we are on long distance Skype or Zoom or Blue Jeans calls with the observer sitting at their home institution working and someone at the telescope working. So we were able to use uh, as we reopened. And what we did was uh, because we're actually commissioning instruments, you know, you want to have an instrument specialist on the mountain along with a telescope and a, a site specialist. And so we ended up with me working in one room. Usually I, me and my team were the ones that were the closest to the telescope because if you hear something over the intercom go bang, you want to be able to shoot up the stairs and find out what the heck it, <laughs> the telescope hit. Um, but then the instrument scientist was usually either in a different room in the building, if it was a big enough building, or in the case of Wynn, which is a really small facility, they were actually in a whole different building, uh, basically calling in remotely on, uh, in Wynn's case, Blue Jeans. And then any other people who needed to be there to look at the data were also on the call working from either their home institutions or in many cases their homes and uh, two things about that was one it, it kind of created the situation where especially in the middle of winter I, I would be on what amounted to 15 hour zoom calls with four or five different people and you know as I was talking to Dr. Dave before we started it's you know, when you're in a room and two people have two th something to say to each other, you're not necessarily really part of that conversation. You can go about your business doing your thing and they talk about it. But, you know, when everyone's on a Zoom call remotely, you're in the middle of every conversation happening all night. And, uh, you know, we, we actually, the, the operations staff, uh, we began to talk about this and we were by the end of the winter starting to really feel some pretty serious uh, Zoom fatigue uh, after these long nights. Um, but uh, another thing that was kind of a, a, an, an interesting uh, thing about being these worldwide operations is watching through the Zoom windows and seeing all the different times of day uh, people were at because some people were calling in from the UK where it was bright and early in the morning for them and you know they were chipper and you know waking up and having their morning cup of coffee you know as we're getting set for you know at 7 p.m and uh, you know Arizona and uh, so that was kind of an interest you know some you know people were just from all different time zones doing uh, coming in and calling into these meetings and that that was kind of interesting to, to see uh, as the year went on. I would add to that at NASA, they very quickly, just like the rest of us, found a way to, to continue operating during the pandemic. And that basically involved a lot of teleconferencing. Now NASA uses WebEx mostly. They also sometimes use Microsoft Teams. There's something about Zoom that they don't like for security reasons. Uh, but yeah, my during the pandemic year uh, up to this point, uh, everything was Zoom and I would have, you know, two, three, four Zoom meetings a day. Um, hopefully I had them spaced. Occasionally I might have a couple back to back, but uh, I didn't experience Zoom fatigue quite as bad uh, as the younger folks. Uh, and I was telling David, you know, if you're a young scientist, an early career scientist who, and you've started a family and you have young kids, they can't go to school. So you got to get them going on online learning. And that really inhibited the productivity of a lot of our younger scientists in terms of writing proposals, writing papers, reviewing papers. So there was a lot of complaints about that. Now, NASA itself 
found a created program to try and make sure nobody starved. If somebody was locked out of their lab or couldn't go and do work, there was funding that to keep them, you know, going uh, through through programs. So they they tried to help a, a lot of that. Um, one of the things that we learned how to do was how to convert scientific conferences that normally go a week into virtual meetings, and. Um, you know, doing public talks, recording talks, and, and having them available, but then doing shorter talks in, in one hour sessions uh, so that everybody can talk, uh, learning how to do posters online through an online uh, meeting, um, using GatherTown or other types of software. Um, the challenge was how do you modify a scientific conference so that you can include international participation? Because in planetary, you've got the large contingent in Europe and then you also have the large contingent in Asia. And the way that that was done was, you know, having sessions, the, having the session chairs who designed the sessions, put them at, at different blocks of time throughout the day. And sometimes it just wasn't convenient for a lot of us here in the United States. The session would start at 4 a.m. or it would start at 10 p.m. or something. But where, where it inconvenienced us, it was a session that really uh, uh, helped uh, the international partners our colleagues uh, to be able to participate. So trying to mix things up, and, and in one case, uh, the American Geophysical Union meeting was spread over two weeks at, at these various times to try and accommodate all of the content that we couldn't get in in, in a, a regular meeting. So there's questions starting to pop up there. Chris Burrell asked, have any experiments or observations interrupted by the pandemic had to be started over or ruined? David, do you wanna take that first? Yeah, um, basically the one that, that uh, what I can say to that is one, uh, with all of the instruments, at least at Kit Peak, you know, these are not instruments that you can just sit and hit the off button and walk away from them. You pretty much do have to have, um, in some cases, uh, they, they have uh, cryogenic pumps that have to be maintained uh, to keep them at a certain temperature. You have to have uh, some a level of voltage maintained to keep them safe. Uh, so what happens is that, that what we actually did over the course of the pandemic was we didn't completely abandon, there, there's two phases here is first, there was kind of a slow ramp down where everything that could be slowly raised up to temperature and brought to a stable state was done so. And then a, a very skeleton staff of about two people were, um, were left on the mountain, basically, who didn't see each other through the course of the day, but, but because they, they would go up and actually walk through and maintain and watch all of these things that needed to be watched. So, I would imagine, you know, that this becomes an, I, I was actually thinking about this uh, from the point of view of like biological experiments and things like that, where there might be issues, but I would imagine, and this is, this is me just kind of guessing, I don't know, uh, but I would imagine there must have been similar kinds of protocols where someone took their time, you know, it must have been like take it down to minimum staff as much as possible and not let these things get ruined because there's a lot of money that goes into the back of, of science experiments. So I maybe somewhere, some, somehow, some, you know, it, it's hard to imagine that something didn't, uh, something bad might not have gone wrong somewhere, but I think a lot of steps were taken to not let that in. Uh, although a lot of things were delayed. And like I said, we, we ended up in the situation where we ended up uh, commissioning an instrument twice and the new spectrograph was effectively delayed about a year because of the pandemic. We would have been in regular science operations probably starting uh, summer of 20, 2020 and instead we're starting basically summer 2021 or fall of 2021. Yeah, my answer to that question is similar. I, I, I'm sure there were experiments or, or things that were had to be started from scratch or ruined. I, I don't know any specifics. In the case of everything that I've done, it was more that things were delayed. And if you're developing an instrument or developing components that are going to go, for example, on our Psyche spacecraft, which is preparing for launch a year from now, uh, if, you're, if your subcontractors have employees to get COVID, and then they can't work, uh, that slows things down. If you have uh, components that you need to have delivered, 
and the, uh, the, the, the source of those components is, is inhibited by COVID in some way, that, that will slow you down. So, you know, uh, some instruments, some components were delayed uh, as a matter of, of, of months, but we had, nothing has stopped. We are proceeding on to finish uh, integration of our spacecraft and, and get it ready for launch on schedule. Um, I think that's also true of the Lucy mission. The, uh, the Jupiter Trojan asteroid mission is scheduled to launch in October or early November, I believe. And um, if they've had a slip, it's only about a month or so. So um, I, they, they were probably far enough ahead that they were able to, uh, to, to not be impacted severely. So um, yeah, it's, it, 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 th th those are the challenges there. For me personally, I actually got infected with COVID in mid-December. I started displaying symptoms on New Year's Eve. I was basically laid out for COVID for two weeks from January 1st through the 14th. Then my wife caught it for me here at home. Um, and she was down from uh, like the 9th or 10th until the 23rd or 24th of January. So, you know, that's a effectively two or more weeks that, you know, we we're, were, were ill enough that we really couldn't do much, uh, anything. So if it happens to me, I, I'm, and it's happened to a lot of other folks as well. So, you know, all of that can, can slow uh, progress on scientific research and, and components. And I see we have another question um, directed to me, but maybe we, we both have something to say about it. Uh, does it take a team to change an instrument connected to a telescope one person at a time on the equipment possible? And the answer is yes, it does take a, a group of people to change uh, most of the instruments uh, up there, especially if they're coming off the telescope and putting one on. Uh, we have, we actually have, uh, during part of our, that eight months that we were deciding how to operate safely, actually involved the institution of a group we call the Change Control Board. And the whole idea was any time that we needed to do an instrument change, the procedure was actually run by them and, and the, the people responsible for that instrument change would, would run it by them to uh, talk about how to do that safely. And, uh, you know, it, it came down to, uh, now there's a, there's a fortunate side here in that when is designed so that it actually can keep four, up to four instruments mounted at one time normally. So this really minimized the number of actual instrument changes that we needed to do on that telescope. On the MAYAL, uh, all we, we, we are now permanently devoted to the dark energy spectrographic in, instruments. So that telescope never changes instruments. So the only time that the, the change control board got it uh, was when they pulled off uh, one of the spectrographs on wind to put up a, a set of imagers uh, for a period of time. And they had to be very careful. Uh, the instruments are big enough that they were able to work it out so that uh, you could have uh, two people who were basically six feet apart and masked uh, with a another person operating a crane standing well away from them and so it was it was just a very kind of it was a matter of really just thinking it through to keep people as as distanced as possible while while working safely uh it also comes up in that the the board was also invoked this summer when uh because the desi spectrograph uh after the first year of operations we we the team pretty much decided that there there was some work that they could do to refurbish basically what they call the the camera action network which without getting into a lot of technical detail is essentially the control electronics uh, desi is a 5000 fiber spectrograph that attempts to try to put a fiber on a target and and it has a little a, a small robot motion in it and that the controllers for those robots some of them were a little bit uh, a little bit finicky and I, I, I think Dr. Dave is probably familiar with 
you know, the lead time on building a lot of these things, you, you end up designing them at a time and then, you know, five years of, of building goes on and then there's, there's better and newer electronics. Uh, one advantage we have being ground-based is we can, we can stop and put the newer and better electronics in and make it a better instrument. And that's uh, what the team wanted to do. So we actually had to uh, um, work with the change control board to find a way to take the DESI pedals off the telescope, which is a very tedious kind of thing because you're dealing with fiber optics that are running two stories and not break those fiber optics while you're taking these things that weigh hundreds of pounds off the telescope. So it's big, heavy uh, instrumentation, but very delicate instrumentation take it off, put them into a clean tent and let people do the work on them. So it was one person at a time working in the clean tent that uh, we did actually have to, uh, uh, we did get uh, permission to ask all of the employees uh, involved in this if they were fully vaccinated. So everyone involved had to be fully vaccinated, masked and uh, working with as much distance as we could regularly. But uh, yeah, we, we've pretty much just about wrapped up that job and hopefully we'll be going back on Sky with the DESI instrument. So uh, it, the short answer is yes, we do have a team and we've yeah. been doing our best to take uh, those measures. I, I would I would add to that just briefly since uh, uh, Catherine has joined us that yeah virtually everything I do is involved with a team you know on the psyche mission various themes uh, my funded research projects the the stereotype of the lonely scientist working in a lab by by himself or herself is a, just a stereotype of the vast majority of everything I've ever done has been working with others and teams and and so you know that's that's my answer but now that uh, uh, Catherine is here. Why don't we let her introduce herself and, and, and say her opening remarks. I've been trying to get on for 40 minutes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, can hear you. Hear we can hear you. There we go. Okay. I, I'm sorry I'm late, but I was trying to get in for 40 minutes and they just wouldn't let me in. I don't know why. Um, my name is Catherine Acero. I am a theoretical physicist and uh, I have about 30 plus books out. I've won the Nebula a couple of times. I write everything ranging from hard SF to softer SF. My focus is usually on the characters, uh, but I like the science. Um, and yeah, I've been doing things during the pandemic in a different way, obviously, than, than usual. I, I think I've missed about half the panel, so I don't want to repeat things people have already said. And that's me. <laughs> so I guess uh, I'll, I'll just ask this, uh, Catherine, are, are you still actively involved in, in your work as a theoretical physicist? I, I can't remember uh, that. Um, well, I ran the Chesapeake math program for many, many years. And my husband was ill and he had a relapse in 2019. So I started to retire, or 2018, sorry. Um, so basically I retired from the, the physics and math part to take care of him. And then when he passed away, I decided to focus on my writing. So I've been doing that for the past few years. I still get asked you know, to, to speak and teach, to speak on science and teach, but writing is my main occupation. All right, David, I see there's another question in the chat window from Janet Worley. She's asking the question, is the current semiconductor supply issue affecting your work? Um, in the case of, of my work on the NASA Psyche mission, the answer is no. The, uh, the design phase and the, uh, the uh, acquisition of all of the individual components to build all the instruments, that predated the pandemic. Uh, so all of that, those materials were in hand before the pandemic started. So that particular issue is not one that's affected us, but you guys might have a different perspective. Yeah, for me- I can't find the chat messages. Should I be able to read messages in chat? Let's see, down at the bottom of Zoom, you should have a uh, chat little- uh, Oh, I have the panel. Lunatic. I have the chat panel, but it's empty. It, oh. it, if you it, it, anything that was presented before you joined, you won't be able to see. But anything oh. further that comes will appear there. All right. 
Okay, so yeah, for us, uh, a sim similar situation. Most of the semiconductor type uh, things were were in and and built before point, but uh, I will say that yeah, supply uh, issues kind of keep coming up in in ways that I think they're affecting everyone, uh, shipping delays, and, and that can be weather as well as uh, pandemic related. Uh, we, we run into just odd shortages that'll delay us, uh, delay something getting done a week here or there at just, just oddball points, but uh, nothing that's really like just shut us down, just, just more been a nuisance for us than, than major level. So are we talking about things that we've had problems with because of the shutdowns during the pandemic? Is, yeah, is so, that so far I mean? that's... <laughs> because I mean, for teaching and for especially doing the sciences, it's been huge. I mean, also not only from, you know, my, from my point of view, but from my daughter, who's a professor of mathematics at Stony Brook. Well, actually she's at a place called the Simon Center, which is associated with Stony Brook you know, we all had to learn how to do it in Zoom, <laughs> like we're doing now. And, you know, the students, it's a lot harder to teach students that way. It's a lot harder to communicate. But there is a flip side, which is collaborations between scientists across the world are increasing because people are getting, they're being forced to use Zoom or other methods. So, you know, my daughter is on every week. She has several meetings where she's talking to people in Poland, you know, all over the world. Uh, and the same for, you know, when I'm talking math with people, whether it's encouraging the students to take more classes, trying to coordinate, you know, competitions, trying to discuss how to do things with colleagues. It's actually benefited from the pandemic because, you know, we as writers are used to being alone. <laughs> My, the way I live didn't really change with the lockdown because that's how writers live. We're, we work alone in our rooms and communicate with the cultures to do that in general, especially across the sciences, I think. And although it's been very difficult, especially for the, th the experimental side, like you were talking about semiconductors, which is, that's something you have to get, right? I think for research and for theoretical communication and for people, you know, building networks with other scientists, it's actually benefited, which is nice. I hope, it, I hope we don't lose that as the world opens up more. Yeah, there's a good example that I've had of exactly that. Um, I make geological maps of the surfaces of other planets and moons and bodies in the solar system. And uh, we have a small community of people who do that. And we have an annual meeting every June, the uh, NASA meeting of uh, annual meeting of planetary geologic mappers. And traditionally, it's an in-person meeting. And it's mostly restricted to the US scientists who do that. But because of the pandemic, we went to a, an online meeting and this afforded the opportunity for a lot of our European colleagues to do the same thing who cannot afford to come over to the US for this, an, this annual in-person meeting. They were able to contribute the last two years by doing online presentations uh, for us during you know, one of these day, you know, day long or half day long Zoom uh, meetings that we had over a couple of days back in June. So our, that actually made the community better by having the online option. And so we are strongly thinking that when this is over with, we're not gonna to go totally back to in-person, but we're gonna to move to hybrid so that we have an in-person, but yeah. then we also have the international colleagues, they can, they can zoom in and participate that way like they had the last two years. And talking about this from a benefit point of view, um, that, yeah. that was one thing that, was that, one was thing one that thing. came up uh, I, I was talking about how the traditional mode with the with the observatory ground-based observatories like Kit Peak being that a scientist would fly in for a couple of weeks and do their observations at the telescope and such and then fly home and you know do the work on the data and even with the commissioning with a single instrument a uh, single single uh, observatory uh, single uh, project going out to the community like desi the dark energy uh, spectrographic instrument 
our mode of operation was going to be essentially five people in the control room uh, operating over over the course of, of continuously with many of the collaborators flying in for a week or two at a time. And the pandemic sort of forced us to, to do a lot of this remotely and we're actually hiring a, a full-time on-site uh, staff person to to work with me as as the instrument control specialist where i'm more the telescope sure. control specialist and um we actually had a, a an interesting talk the other day from one of our collaborators talking about how astronomers can help climate change and one of his big uh takeaways from that was to find just more ways to work remote and not spend so much time flying here and there and and making long yeah. uh, trips to to on-site places to do work yeah my husband used to say exactly that he worked on ligo and before you know this last the up before the upgrade that allowed them to finally start getting data he used to have to fly down to uh, not the one in on the West Coast, but the other one, which I it's in Louisiana. Is that right? I think so. The other like he used to have to fly down there, and plus he was on the the night shift, which meant he had to sit in this installation, you know, all night trying not to sleep. And they you know, there'd be one other person there, and they'd be watching, you know, movies they got from Blockbuster because they had nothing to do, and there was no data coming in. And he used to say, if only they could be doing collaborations, talking to other people, you know, doing something so that they weren't just sitting there in this lovely facility. And I think, you know, they would have really benefited from having uh, a more interactive. I don't even think Zoom was available back then. It's been a while. But yeah, it's like even allowed us to do things like, uh, you know, instead of having people sit through those entire, you know, long winter nights, uh, you know, 14, 15 hour nights, uh, <laughs> it's allowed people to split the shifts. And, you know, you could have a, a you can have yeah. one scientist dial in for half the night. And then at midnight, there's a handover uh, remotely. And so you have, uh, you, you have the team. So we're, there, we're still five people working all night, but it's, you, you swap out a couple yeah. of the different uh, people. And so people don't have to work these long, exhausting shifts just to get it done. Yeah, yeah the, think... uh, the, uh, the issue with the, uh, the ability to reduce carbon footprint by not doing as much travel is something that's become noticed because of having to do all these virtual meetings. Matter of fact, the American Geophysical Union, we have our annual meeting in December, usually in San Francisco. It usually has about 25,000 geoscientists from all over the world there. And the uh, committee who organized that meeting is thinking, you know, because we've successfully done an online meeting in the in 2020, uh, is that maybe we should switch perhaps even every other year from in person to an all online meeting and then reduce all that air travel from folks from the Asia and Europe coming over here and even within the United States and just do it online, you know, there's there's the, the big uh, disadvantage is, is the younger scientists need to get together with with other people yeah. and network and you can do some networking online but uh you know some of that needs to be in person so that's why I probably wouldn't do that every single year but maybe staggered or, or some sort of a cadence for doing something like that well you know i wonder if right now we're in uh, a transition period that COVID forced us to face the trans transition sooner. I don't, I think it's completely under reasonable to expect that, you know, 10 years down the line, some, some time down the line, we'll be doing these kind of meetings virtually. And eventually, it's not that we don't know how to do it, it's that right now, it's not uh, logistically, you know, to do virtual uh, meetings. We don't, we're not really at the level of technology to do it seamlessly but we will be eventually and if you could do a virtual meeting so it's as if you were actually there doing all the 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 networking and, and you could make yourself look you know, 20 years younger if you want <laughs> <laughs> but i think what covid did is force us to face that transition sooner and I don't think it's a bad thing, but I do agree, David, with what you were saying. There are some advantages 
in-person communication or interact that you never you're never going to lose them especially for new people and I, I've seen this even just amongst the science fiction conventions. On, on one hand, it's like, I love these virtual conventions in that I'm yeah. able to attend some events that I wouldn't have been able to attend otherwise, just because I can just dial into it. But I, but I have been missing that, that in-person, you know, just between panels talking to people, you know, that, that's, the, mm -hmm. that's the aspect that kind of gets lost. Uh, you know, you get a little bit of that through Discord, but it's not quite the same typing in a chat as, as just sitting there face to face. Yeah, and going for coffee. But you yeah. know, I love that we can do this I'm in Long Island, New York right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I heard about this convention and, you know, I'd heard about a lot of conventions. And I never got to go to them because they're so far away. And yet here we are. <laughs> I do think though that science has suffered in the sense of in-person work and experimental work. For example, you know, to use students, because that's who I interact with the most, they can't go into the lab when you're on lockdown. You can't do a lab virtually. You can't do a lot of the scientific uh, research that experimenters do, you know, on Zoom. You have to be there in the lab mixing chemicals or, you know, weighing things or doing your physics. It's definitely and slowed the, uh, the process of, of work and graduation for some of our grad students because they weren't able to get yeah. into the labs. And, uh, on another end, you know, uh, the summer of the pandemic, 2020, was a time when some students were, you know, do studying in the academic year and then would get internships to work during the summertime. But because everything shut down, they were stuck. They didn't have an in internship opportunity, and which means they didn't have any money coming in. So those of us yeah. who try to fund grad students to make sure they can survive over the summer break had to scramble and find solutions to problems like that. So, yeah, those, those. That was cool. a big one. Yeah. yeah. And it was heartbreaking for, you know, I worked, I used to work with some of the top math students. These kids knew more than most college students. Some of them knew more than college professors. They were the top students in the world. You know, they were winning things like the USA Mathematical Olympiad. And on the younger students, I had kids who were winning and going to nationals in something called math counts, which is huge for middle school students. And they just canceled it all. You know, all these kids who would, it's like the Olympics. You work all your life to make, you know, you only get maybe one or two shots at it. And then that's it. And it's like for these kids, they were like the Olympians of mathematics. And they didn't get their shot because of COVID. And, you know, that it's not like it impacted their education in the sense that they couldn't learn properly, but it impacted their love of the subject, which is just as important. And, you know, on the, on the flip side of the, of the lack of travel, it's, it's one of the things that, uh, one of the things that is an appeal about astronomy is getting to travel to observatories in different locations. I think some of my favorite experiences in, in the field were getting to go down to Chile, for instance, and operate, you know, do, do some astronomy at uh, Cerro Tololo uh, outside of La Serena, Chile, and uh, just getting to spend some time in the town before and after. It, um. It's like, yeah, if you're doing remote astronomy, uh, yeah, you get to use the instrument, but you, you kind of lose that, that little bit of cultural experience. Uh, yeah, I used to travel at least one trip every month for you know, the last 23 years. Uh, but, you know, when the pandemic hit, I, was at, I had a meeting at JPL in February of 2020, and then the shutdown occurred, and I haven't been on an airplane since. My next scheduled trip is the... Geological Society of Annual Meeting, which is being held, at hybrid, uh, I think, either hybrid or in person in Portland. Uh, so that's when I'll be traveling, and that's mid-October. So, you know, this is the longest time I've ever gone without being on an airplane traveling somewhere uh, uh, in my life. <laughs> Oops, I think, I think you muted, Catherine, somehow. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yep. Now we can. Yeah, I, I went on my first, I stopped going in 2019, I think was late 2019, my last 
pre-COVID. No, I went to Toronto in February of 2020. And then everything locked down. And I didn't go for, I think, until last May 2021. I was a guest of honor at a very small convention in um, one of the Carolinas. It was, uh, uh, oh, what was it? Atomicon, which was a lot of fun. It was a great convention, but it was very odd doing an in-person convention again. We were all being so careful <laughs> talking, you know, to each other from six feet away and things like that. And I, you know, I wonder if this new normal that we've got in, to our interactions with COVID, even just talking from a distance away. I, I don't know if it's gonna go back. You know, business is normal, business as usual. I don't think, at least in the scientific community, it'll ever be quite the same. Well, I'm yeah. certainly gonna carry a mask with me, uh, and keep it in my office. And when the fall comes around, I'll probably wear it just walking around because you know, other than when I had COVID, I didn't get, have any other illness. I didn't get the flu or didn't get anything else. So I think I, I see certain students walking around on the ASU campus uh, before the pandemic wearing masks. And I assume it was just to keep them from getting the flu. And that certainly seemed to work. So that's something I might consider doing. So you had COVID? I, I missed because I guess because I came in late. I didn't didn't know that. Yeah, I was doing everything right, right. Uh, social distancing, mask wearing, avoiding crowds, not going to, to to movies or anything like that through all of 2020. And then on Thursday, December 17th, I had a dental cleaning appointment, and that was the only time I was inside, indoors, in a room, unmasked for any length of time. And exactly oh, two yeah. weeks after that is when I started displaying symptoms of COVID. And uh, so New Year's Eve all the way until about uh, January 14th, I was sick with COVID and my wife caught it for me. And then she was even worse sick. Uh, but fortunately, we both recovered and we, we okay. eagerly were awaited and got our vaccines when they became available to us in March and early April. Okay. And uh, so, yeah, yeah. COVID, it was not fun uh, having COVID. It, it was very disabling, um, you know, um, and so uh, that was just time that we couldn't do anything. Well, thank goodness you're okay. You look great. Yes. Well, thank you. I, the thing that I don't know is whether I, there was any long-term damage to my lungs or anything. Uh, there's a mountain in our backyard, and when it cools down enough, I may try and climb it again because that get requires very heavy breathing to, to do that. And I haven't had a chance to try that yet, so. Well, I certainly hope there's long-term uh, effects from that. Uh, I haven't noticed so. any, so fingers crossed, <laughs> but thank you both. Yes. <laughs> Are there any more questions from the audience? I guess also there's a question. Yeah, go ahead. I'm still not getting anything in the chat. Yeah, there hasn't been any new questions yet since you joined. Oh, all right. <laughs> well, I think one, one question that in regards to COVID is, you know, the Delta variant slammed us after we thought we were getting better. And, you know, when we conquer the Delta variant, if we can ever get everyone vaccinated, you know, what else will come out? You know, it's, I don't know if we'll ever be able to say, okay, we can start interacting again like we used to, because, you know, unless we get some real, some, you know, vaccine, you know, unless we eradicate it like we did with scarlet fever or mumps or whatever, it's always going to be there, you know, doing its mutation thing. <laughs> I think we're going to end up having to have that, you know, like we get our annual flu vaccines every fall. I think they'll probably yeah. just dump COVID yeah. into that to for updated for whatever the, the current variant is. And it'll just be managed that mm -hmm. way. And the only people who will be disadvantaged uh -huh. are those that can't or choose not to get vaccinations. So are you both scientists or observers? David, are you an observer? Yeah, I'm basically, I'm uh, my, my position is I, I'm an observing associate at Kitt Peak National Observer, like one of the one of the senior staff there. And uh, 
Do you know my husband, John Canito? I think he went out there a few times. Um, I'm sorry, you broke up a little bit. What was his last Does name that again? Ring any bells? Uh, you broke up. What was his last name? Canizzo? Canizzo, yeah, he was at Goddard Center. Okay, um, not offhand, but uh, uh, it's there, you know, certainly it's one of the full uh, back in the days when we actually gathered in the cafeteria, <laughs> um, you would see a lot of people and, and some of them you'd meet one time. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's very possible I would have run across him, but, uh, but I don't think I ever actually worked directly with him. Yeah, well, he had good things to say about Kip Peak. He liked it yes. there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a it's a neat place. It's of course it's the one of the things about it is it's the the world's largest collection of telescopes on one mountain, and it really is kind of like a city. And and I can't help I, I should have grabbed it before the panel, but uh, Catherine Wells uh, wrote a post apocalyptic novel. People came up and occupied. As it was this remote location where it had all of all of sort of the city resources. There was there, there was the uh, the fire barn where you had emergency resources. You had a water system. You had electrical generators and everything, and it actually made a, a lot of sense uh, as a as a thing. And I, I kept thinking, you know, I, I've thought more than once that we're sort of living almost that, uh, you know, with sort of the jokes about the li living in the apocalypse. Uh, you know, keep living up there during all of this feels a little like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, another nice one is Oak Ridge. The last scientific convention I went to or conference before the pandemic was the um, Tennessee Valley Interstellar Workshop. I was one of the chairs of one of the sessions. And that was a lot of fun. That was a way to meet a lot of people. And we also brought students out. You know, we gave some student awards and I think it meant a lot to them to be able to actually go to a place like Oak Ridge and see everything that's going on there and meet all those famous NASA scientists, you know, and, and we had some famous science fiction writers there for the session where we talked about, you know, extrapolations into the future. And, you know, that's something else that I had a student who won an award from them and also from the Chess Peak Math program that I run. And he was one of the last students before COVID shut down that was able to go out there and do all that. And I know he loved it. And I, you know, I'm sure it inspires these kids. So, and I think David, you were saying about the internships, those have the same kind of effect. I really hope we can go back to do that for the young people because that's what brings them into science for some yeah, of them. I, I and was, we want I was... them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I I, 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 I I fondly remember my early internships uh, working at the in, in the California State University system, and then my daughter just had her first internship. Is a going she was between her freshman and sophomore years uh, this summer and she had a NASA internship at NASA Ames except it was all remote so it, it, oh, yeah. it she kind of missed that getting to actually visit NASA Ames and and see the, all the other interns and work with them but still it was a I, I think it, it was a good experience and and it sounds like uh, her supervisor is interested in hiring her again so I'm fingers crossed oh, she'll right. actually get to get to go to San Francisco next summer Knock on wood. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, I did. An, uh, my undergrad degree was in astronomy and astrophysics before I switched into planetary geology in graduate school. And I did do an internship, a 10 week internship at the Sacramento Peak Solar Observatory in uh, New Mexico near Alamogordo. And uh, that, that was a great experience, but it taught me that I didn't want to study stars or galaxies or nebula. I wanted to study planets, just like the Star Trek crew did. And so that's why <laughs> I got involved in the field of planetary geology and got my master's and PhDs in geology. So that's so cool. So yeah. the internships can be valuable to help center you on what it is you're really passionate about. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I, I did an internship at Mariah Mitchell Observatory on Nantucket, and that was that was just an amazing experience. Yeah, you know, who grew up in the Southwest U.S. and 
going out to, you know, New England was a, a very different, and, yes. and you know, these, <laughs> these other students from all around the country, it was just yeah, a great I, experience. Yeah. I grew up in California, and then I went to grad school in Cambridge, Massachusetts. That was a yes. huge <laughs> change. But you know, yeah. I did an internship at, at Caltech, and I think I just, I was amazed. What it did for me was I was one of the only women back a long time ago. You know, I did this in the 1970s, late 1970s as an undergrad, and to be selected for that and to get to go to Caltech and do research with this famous scientist who ran the group I was in, it helped build my confidence. I thought, oh, yeah, I can do this. This is something I can do. I felt like an imposter when I went to interview for it. Like, you know, <laughs> I'm this dumb little grad, dumb little undergraduate, you know, and there's no other women around, anywhere around. Caltech had almost no women then. But, you know, he was perfectly reasonable. And he said, yeah, you know, and he, he told, he was like, he was trying to sell me on it. So that made a huge difference, not only in being exposed to the science, but in helping give confidence, you know, to, to go on in it. And, and the Mariah Mitchell experience was actually a wonderful experience from the flip side, because traditionally it was a astronomy program. And I was one of the two guys in that program that summer so it was us two and a whole <laughs> bunch of women astronomers and uh you know it, it really kind of you know made made me a lot more sensitive to to you know un underrepresented voices you know that are working around me <laughs> oh well that's good that's good yeah it's, astronomy i think has a tradition of more women in the field than a lot of the other sciences there are a lot of women many, many, many years ago, decades ago, at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Mm -hmm. And when I was there as a graduate student, I wasn't the only woman. I was often in my physics classes and my applied math classes. I was the only woman. And, you know, they've, the professors were, people were less woke then. <laughs> they would make cracks like I'd raise my hand and they said, why do you want to ask a question and things like that, which they would never say now. But at the observatory, which is, you know, I worked for Alex Delgarno, who was one of, he had his, he was up at the Harvard Smithsonian Observatory. And there were other women, you know, and he actively encouraged female graduate students to, you know, go into the field. And that was nice. But I yeah, think so I was just going to ask, was uh, Amelia Belzerine there when you were there? Was that, was she after that time? What was the name? Amelia Belzerine. Is she from Europe? Like, was it Denmark or someplace like that? No, she was actually American, but I, I'm trying to remember where she was from. But she, uh, um, yeah, she was at, at Harvard Smithsonian, but and then she became the director of Mariah Mitchell when I was when I was there. Really? Yeah. Was she? When was she there? Do you know? So. Do you know what year? I, I think she started in the 70s, but I don't remember when specifically in the 70s. So I, I would have worked... probably saw her if she was still there. You know, I mean, people tended to notice us. <laughs> we kind of stood out, you know. <laughs> I mean, there was another grad student who came over from Europe when I was there. Her name started with an E, but I don't think that was it. Yeah. I mean, she was my age, you know, she was younger. Yeah, but Lee would have. Great place. I really liked it there. Yeah, Lee. She's passed away now. She passed away about five, ten years ago. But uh, she, she probably would have been. She probably would have been in her. Uh, let's see, in the seventies, she probably would have been in her forties. Oh. Say the name again. So Amelia Belzerine. You know, it's not ringing any bells. What yeah. was her area? So uh, stellar physics, she was a, she, er, in her graduate school day, she uh, was a graduate student of Martin Schwarzfield, uh, Schwarzfield oh. of the Schwarzfield yeah. radius. Yeah. yeah. Well, I probably didn't interact with her a lot. I was over with the theoreticians. Right. You know, we were into computers mostly. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm sure I saw her there. You know, I just probably didn't know her name.
Well, I think we've come up to the end of our time. I think unless there's a, any very last minute uh, comments or questions. Nothing in the chat. Yeah. I was just saying exactly the same thing on mute. So thank you for that, David. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to finish up giving our websites? Sure. You guys go first, since I'm the latecomer here. <laughs> Just type well, it in the chat. That's what we were doing in the other one. Sure, I'll do that. I don't really have a website. I'm, uh, I, I don't write sci-fi novels like the others here, at least not yet. <laughs> I'll wait till retirement before I think about that. But uh, I can put down, I guess, my lab. Well, you know, people would sometimes joke that maybe my thesis was my first science fiction novel. <laughs> <laughs> it was all quantum mechanics you know that sounds pretty uh pretty science fiction -y. i also have a patreon page if people want to help keeping me from having to go waitress table <laughs> well it's a pleasure to, to meet both of you, uh, and, and the panel of you guys so um thanks everybody i'm gonna sign off thanks, yeah and... thank you thank you for Good. being so patient and apologies, on. Catherine, for not letting you in sooner. I was uh, actually ending up moderating another panel in Discord. So I've been mostly absent from here, but I've tried to keep an eye on the waiting room. Oh, well, thank you. I got in. I got in. I'll, I'll be back at 545 with Lee Whiteside and Dr. Kim Smith to talk about The Expanse, the TV show and the books of James S.A. Corey. So until then, see ya. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye. All right. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.